23rd July 2002. I was sitting in a plane at the tarmac of Delhi airport in tears. I had just said goodbye to friends and family, but my mother didn't say goodbye to me. She was too upset. You might ask, what did I do to upset her so much that she didn't want to talk to me? Well, I was a failure, but not in the way many of you may think. Growing up in India, life was always about success and failure. In a country of more than one billion people, survival of the fittest as a philosophy plays out in every aspect of your life, every single day. Most parents work extremely hard, spend a huge part of their life earnings to ensure their children don't get left out of good schools and good jobs. Then, they want to see their children settled. In other words, they want to make sure that their children marry someone suitable, someone who has been meticulously shortlisted and screened through the traditional arranged marriage system. A system that most parents rely on to ensure that child doesn't get left out in marrying someone who has an equally good job or better income, comes from the same religion and caste, has a well-matched horoscope, the list is endless. <laughs> and I, as I found out, as a girl, you better be light-skinned, you better know how to cook well, or you won't qualify. And you better get married before 30. Are you out of the arranged marriage market? Let me think. Quite like the best before date on most supermarket products. I felt sick in my stomach. I had no doubts that my parents had anything but happiness in their mind, in their heart for me. But their faith in the arranged marriage system as a part to my happiness? Uh-uh. <laughs> Very reluctantly to keep peace at home, I even met some of these shortlisted guys. Time and again getting rejected for not being a vegetarian, for missing out by an inch in terms of an ideal preferred height. I grew tired of patronizing comments coming from prospective grooms and their parents. Like, we want to know how well she cooks, so let's have dinner at your place. Or, wow, your girl is lucky. She's girl number 44 that our son is seeing. He usually doesn't take that long to say no. The fact that he's spending a little bit more time with her, she must be the lucky one. I went to some of the best schools in India that taught me how to think for myself, and this is what I was listening. This is what my life was going to be. It um, felt like a rope tightening around my neck. And eventually, I mustered enough courage to say no to an arranged marriage. I became a failure in my culture, in my community, for my family, particularly for my mother, who so wanted to see me settled with a suitable boy. I somehow became this enduring symbol of pain and humiliation. And all I wanted to do 
pursue my own dreams, be my own person, forge my own path. So when I decided to take the first step towards forging my own path by coming to study here in New Zealand, I didn't realize that all this personal experience of being seen as a failure is going to come out on the surface one day in an entrepreneurship class. <laughs> that day in class, we were discussing a lot about inspiring stories of wonderfully successful New Zealand entrepreneurs. And I was like, that's great. Hey, but what about the failed ventures? Who are the people behind those? Where are they? After all, failure is common in entrepreneurship. Nearly half of the new startups are going to fail within the first five years. Yet we have very little research, we know very little, we can learn so much. So my research led me to interview dozens of entrepreneurs who were regarded as entrepreneurial failures. And I was surprised to learn about the extent of stigma around failure in these conversations. I saw glimpses of my life in their stories. When a venture is showing signs of failure, it's very difficult to deal with the reality of it. One wants to hide behind a veil. One wants to conceal their worries. Being secretive and lying is easier because the sense of shame and dread and judgment around failure makes it easier to conceal. One doesn't ask for help. See, if failure was accepted as a normal part of learning, one would ask for help. One would ask for help when people could help. Not when the debt collectors are knocking at the door. Not when the banks are putting the houses up for auction. Not when the marriages are falling apart. Not when the stress of holding it all within is so overwhelming that one starts sinking into depression or even think of suicide as the way to escape. When a venture fails, one feels exposed. One feels vulnerable. Those common symbols of success, the house, the car, the bank balance, the rewards, the recognition, lovely stuff that the media wrote about the venture, all gone. One is gripped by a debilitating sense of loss. And what makes this experience even harder? If there, if there is judgment, if there is rejection, if there is stigma, stereotyping, labeling, shunning, ostracizing. If it is coming from the people who are vital part of the community, who were once part of the journey of starting and managing this venture, but it's even harder to deal with when it's coming from closest friends and family. But I also learned from these conversations that the failure experience can be transformed. One can choose to rebuild their lives again. One can risk making the same mistakes, or one can choose a completely different path. You know, where the embellishments of your previous successful life are no more meaningful because you have new jewels on the fabric of your life. Stigma or judgment, rejection, it can be overcome too. You see, the way we see and look at failure has grave consequences for the person who is seen to have failed. Okay, when a child is learning to walk, we know the child's gonna fall. We don't, don't turn our back and walk off. We offer a helping hand because we understand that that's normal part of learning and development. 
So failure is an important part of landscape, the economic landscape, because it's forcing us to look at what are some of the mistakes we may have made? What are some of the skills we need to build on? What skills can we refine? Can we look at our business concept again? Or the environment? Failure of the venture is not the same as failure of the entrepreneur, the person who started that venture. The thing is, failure can mean different things to different people. Just like success means different things to different people. So in 2002, when I was sitting in that plane bound for New Zealand, I didn't think I was a failure. I was just trying to live my life through my personal values and not accept this socially well-accepted definition of what's ideal or what's not. But for my mother, my family, my culture, my community, I was a failure. So when you're next time thinking about your own venture that may be failing or you're reading about a failing venture, I encourage you to think about what failure means to you and how it can be used in your life. Stigma can be overcome. Silence the critic within you. Stop seeking approval. Build your tribe again. Help other struggling businesses or aspiring entrepreneurs. But most importantly, craft your own definition of success and failure. Don't hide from it. Don't conceal it. Embrace it. Let it fuel your next flight to the next project in life, to the next venture. Wrap yourself in the jewels of the new you, the new success. Enjoy that. And in New Zealand, can we please have a safe space where we can sit down together freely, openly, share about our failure experiences. Can we do that? Because healthy businesses need healthy entrepreneurs, and it begins with a healthy attitude towards failure. Thank you.